Hello, fifth grade, and welcome to history. This week, the French Revolution. Okay, so first things first. It is a very common and very incorrect belief that the French Revolution was brought about solely and only by Marie Antoinette. This is false, and we're going to talk about why. But we're just going to throw that one out there first because it's wrong. Um, okay, so uh, going through your notes, and I'm going to be supplementing in. Um, so French Revolution, 1787 to 1799, that's the whole course of when basically there was almost no government in France. Literally, there was no government for like 12 years. It was chaos. Um, and at the end of that time, 1799 is when actually Napoleon comes in. But we'll talk to him. We'll, the, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, okay, so first off, in your notes, there are three things, uh, and they all have a star next to them, or at least they should. It says the Enlightenment, uh, heavy taxes, and the lower classes are the three. Uh, so basically what that is, is these are the three things that ultimately lead to what is the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. So let's talk about what exactly these things are and how this caused just a massive domino effect into chaos. Um, so first off, the Enlightenment, which uh, in your notes it says arguments for social reform. That is a very, 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 very diluted version of what the Enlightenment was. The Enlightenment was actually something that went on for over a hundred years. Uh, it's debated whether it started like 1685 or 1715, um, but it, it went till about 1815 and then it turned into Romanticism and Romanticism ultimately became Modernism, which is just the worst. Um, but anyways, what is the Enlightenment? Well, the Enlightenment was this philosophical debate and argument that was going on between a lot of different philosophers like Kant, Descartes, um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was mixed up in it, um, and you had Thomas Paine was in there, John Locke. There are a lot of people. If your parents are watching, they probably recognize some of the names I just said. You probably don't, but that's okay. You'll know about them later. Um, not in this lecture, but in your life, you'll, you'll learn about them. Um, but anyways, basically what they were saying was that everything is rational. Everything can be understood. It was essentially, in many ways, an argument against God, almost like early atheism, because they were saying you can fully explain everything in the universe and everything that has happened. You can fully catalog all of human knowledge if you want to, and they tried to, believe me. Um, but basically, you can scientifically and mathematically and rationally figure out how everything has happened, why everything has happened, how everything was made and created. And it was basically this call to, if everybody is rational, nothing bad will happen. Like nothing bad can happen if everyone's being a rational person. Now it's funny that this is what they were saying. And then what led to what, what, <laughs> what came after it was the reign of terror where everything was chaos, even though everyone was acting rationally. Um, so, you know, that worked out great for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, next, heavy taxes to, oh, and I should also say, with the Enlightenment, one other important aspect, it was a major questioning of authority. Now, people saw the American War for Independence, I'm not saying revolution because they're different, people saw the American War for Independence and they said, ah, rationalism, look, they are being rational and they are rising above these tyrants. We should go against authority. Now that's not necessarily what America actually did. They were protesting injustices in the taxation, no representation for the colonies, etc. So they were actually just protesting illegal things that were happening. In France, however, they started being like, ah, yes, all authority must die. And everything goes crazy. Um, so another ma major aspect of, uh, of the Enlightenment was severe questioning of authority, uh, of how governments should function and if there should be monarchs. So that's another large aspect. Okay, second off, heavy taxes to fund wars. Okay, this got started with Louis XIV and Louis XV. If you remember Louis XIV, his nickname was the Sun King because everything was gold. Uh, so he taxed the people a decent amount and they got a lot of money into the government. Enough to, you know, cover a roof with gold, as I showed you pictures of at Versailles. Um, so they took in a lot of money. And then they got into some wars in Europe, which they shouldn't have done because you know, you know about a piece of Westphalia. Um, and then, uh, and then they actually helped fund the American War for Independence, which was not an inexpensive thing to do. Because if you are funding a war that is not happening on your continent, it will cost a lot of money. Because France, coincidentally, is not on the same continent as America. Not sure if you knew that, but it's not. Um, 
One is in Europe, one is in North America. You have to cross a sea to get to the other. So to be able to send troops and people and horses and supplies uh, and cannons and guns to America, that's gonna cost a lot of money because it's not just happening in your hometown or your home country, it's happening thousands of miles away and you are funding this war. So that's gonna be a bit pricey, uh, it was. So that didn't go over very well because the wars were very expensive, as could be understood. And then finally, the lower classes, also known as the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie, very fun to say, um, or the bourgeois uh, would be the singular, bourgeoisie is plural. Um, so the lower classes were angry at being excluded from positions of honor because basically the people in government were people who were royalty or related to royalty. Uh, it was not something like in America where you could just pick a random person and elect them to Senate, even if they don't have experience. <laughs> AOC. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not something where you could just take a random person and elect them. Uh, you had to be related to someone in government somehow to get elected to that position, which to be fair, they were not wrong. The lower classes were not being represented very well because no one from the lower classes was in government. So that's an understandable complaint. Now, a lot of the things around the French Revolution are very understandable complaints. However, as my old mentor and teacher and pastor, Dr. Grant has said, the right thing done in the wrong way will always lead to ruin. So this is something where it was the right thing, it was done in completely the wrong way, and it ended in disaster for France that they still have not gotten out of. Like, they're still in a bad spot because of this 200 years ago. Um, okay, anyways. So, first, we have the aristocratic revolt. Uh, 1787 to 1789. The aristocrats are the people who are above, so the bourgeoisie, there's a few terms you have to learn that are French. Uh, bourgeoisie is the lower class, the poor people. The aristocrats are the rich people, or the people related to the king, the aristocracy. Um, so, the aristocratic revolt, what this was, was there was a proposal to tax nobles to eliminate debt in the country, which was a pretty good idea because they're the ones, you know, who have money. However, the aristocrats don't like this because it's their money that's going to be taken from them. Now, it is wrong to tax only one type of people because that is very selective. However, it is also something where the poor had been paying taxes for a while, the rich had not. And so the poor saw this as, okay, that's very fair. They should have to pay some taxes right about now. And the rich said, oh, but this is our money. We don't want to give. Um, and so they didn't want to do this. So at this point, Louis XVI uh, decides to elect a new financial minister. And that causes sort of a peace, but not really. Uh, now, I should explain with how things fell out. Louis XIV blew a ridiculous amount of money. Sun King. Louis XV was very stupid and he did not know what to do with a country that was running out of money. So he did not fix anything, he made it worse. So then Louis XVI uh, comes into the throne and he is very young when he comes into the throne. He was 16 when he got married to Marie Antoinette uh, and then they became the king and queen and they did not have any experience in trying to you know, save money or anything like that. And so they were trying their best in many ways and just didn't really know how to do it. So one of the ways you can tell that Louis XVI was actually trying to do the right thing is he appoints a new financial minister. He says, okay, there's clearly a problem here. We cannot keep spending money because that's, we're going to run out of money. In fact, we've kind of already run out of money. So we need someone to come in and manage how we're spending, what we're spending it on, and try to help us get out of this hole. So Louis XVI actually takes steps to try and fix the country. However, what happens when you do this, and this happened with Margaret Thatcher in England in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, was if you want to get out of debt, you have to make cuts. And if you make cuts, it means that people will have to go without certain things for a while or with less of a certain thing for a while. This caused massive, massive riots in England in the 80s. But guess what? She fixed their economy and people hated her for it. Um, if you ever look up Margaret Thatcher, she is fantastic. Um, 
totally awesome. People hated her just unreasonably. One of my favorite things that she ever said was, if my opponents saw me walk across the Thames, which is the river, if my opponents saw me walk on water, basically, they would say it was because I didn't know how to swim. Uh, which is fantastic. So basically, they wanted to find fault with her no matter what she did, even though she literally fixed the country's economy almost single-handedly, which is very impressive. Uh, but anyways, so Louis XVI is going to do this, which means that there are going to be taxes on everybody, and people are not going to have as much money as they used to because you have to get the country righted. This annoys a lot of people, despite the fact that it would actually fix the economy. So here comes the tennis court oath. The tennis court oath happens June 20th, 1789. Um, so they basically said, we need to have representation and we will not separate except to reassemble wherever circumstances require until the constitution of the kingdom is established. Basically, we will keep meeting even if we have to move places because people want us dead or something. Um, we will keep meeting until we can get this ship righted. Now, this was actually a very good thing. However, the door was locked and guarded, and this caused the people to panic because they thought that something very shady was going down in that people were doing something behind their back that was bad. They weren't, but they thought they were. So then we get to the National Assembly. With the National Assembly, food starts getting scarce, and the poor people say it is an aristocratic conspiracy, and there is panic in the streets because they think they're getting ripped off. Now, what was actually happening was the economy was starting to get righted because there were cuts in certain areas because they had to sell food, which meant everyone had less. But the bourgeoisie did not think that it was it was um, also the aristocrats who were suffering. They thought it was just them. So they assumed we're getting totally starved and it's a conspiracy designed to kill us. They're haunting us and it causes panic. This panic builds and builds and builds until July 14th when they, um, when they attack the Bastille, which is a prison, and they seize it along with all of the weapons it had inside of it. Not a good thing. This was the official start of the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. So they came up with a slogan for the revolution called Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, which means liberty, equality, and brotherhood, um, which is very funny that they said those, they, <laughs> it's very ironic that those were the three terms they used to describe the revolution, because I'm gonna explain why that's ironic in just a second. Okay, so um, this all starts up. September of 1793 until July of 1794 is what is officially termed as the reign of terror. Basically, a lot of people were dying. Um, so there was, of course, the guillotine. Guillotine was a very fast way to kill people. Uh, and so they took this over and the people took control. They got all of the guillotines and they started just killing people. Um, the royal family was seized from their home. Uh, I believe at the time they were actually at Versailles. Uh, they were seized. Uh, in January 1793, Louis XVI was killed. Uh, and October of 1793, Marie Antoinette was killed. Uh, their children were also taken captive. Uh, one of them died in prison. Uh, it didn't just, it was bad stuff. Um, Marie Antoinette's last words when she went up to the guillotine was she, um, she walked up and she accidentally stepped on the executioner's foot and was, uh, quoted officially as her last words being, um, I'm sorry, monsieur, I did not mean to do it, uh, before she was killed. Um, so with all of this, the reign of terror got unbelievably out of hand. First off, you shouldn't kill the leaders. That's a bad idea. Uh, second off, they were imprisoning women, children, and clergy. Uh, the reason they were imprisoning clergy goes back to the enlightenment. They were saying, ah, well, because the king and queen were very famously Catholic, uh, and that's the religion of the country, that is a form of slavery. So we must get rid of all Christianity and Catholicism in our country because we perceive that to be slavery. And because we are getting rid of that, we need to set up a new religion. So they set up what they called the religion of reason with a capital R, notice enlightenment. Um, and basically they said, yes, our goddess, they made a goddess. Um, ours is the goddess of reason because we only, uh, we only worship being reasonable, which is very funny because they literally like invented their own God after saying all gods are pointless and for some reason didn't see the irony of that. Um, but anyways, 
And they tried to set up this religion of reason. Um, and when they were doing this, they actually started kidnapping and um, capturing uh, clergy members, like priests and pastors, and guillotining them. And that's when people started to see that things were getting a little out of hand. Now, when things got super out of hand was when they set up boxes. Uh, and these boxes were basically for you to report on your neighbor. And things very quickly went from people who were aristocrats or directly disobeying the law to, hey, that person has a nicer house than I do. I'm gonna accuse them of being an aristocrat. And basically, if you wrote someone's name on a paper and put it in one of those boxes, within a week, they were probably dead uh, because they would be, they would immediately be taken into custody and put in prison. And then probably within a week, they would be guillotined. So it turned from being something according to them, where they were trying to even out and make sure everyone was equal to where it was, if anyone had something nicer than you, they were, they were trying to force it in your face that they were better than you. And so they must die, which is absolute insanity. Um, and it was, it was literally just like, we all have to be exactly equal, equal. And because most of us are poor and we're dirty and we don't take care of our clothes and our houses are terrible. If you have anything better than that, you must die, which is absolute insanity. Because, you know, if you follow that logic, if the person who has the nicer house than you dies and you take over their house, well, suddenly you have a nicer house, which means guess who's next up on the chopping block? You, because you now have something better than other people. Uh, which is just insanity. Socialism, ugh. Okay, um, so they set up the Committee of Public Safety, which is hyper an oxymoron because it was anything but for public safety considering it killed a lot of people um, if they had something nicer than someone else. So the Committee of Public Safety was in charge of um, executions, of accusations against people, all of the trials, all of that good stuff. Um, they were in charge of all this. So with that, the leaders of the revolution, and these were the people who were kind of involved with um, the Committee of Public Safety. You had uh, Jacques-Pierre Bousseau, which is just a fantastically fun name. Um, you have Maximilien Robespierre. Uh, I think in your notes, I accidentally put a comma in there. I was not supposed to put a comma in there. Um, my apologies. It's one name, Maximilian, spelled different than it should be. And um, uh, Robespierre. Uh, so he was kind of one of the main leaders of the revolution. Good stuff. Um, so yay for him. <laughs> uh, great. Good job. Um, also, and I put this in my notes, I didn't put it in yours. Coincidentally enough, with all of these leaders of the revolution, uh, each of them was almost, well, almost each of them, not quite all, but almost all of them. Almost all of them was, uh, was actually killed by the guillotine, um, which is just fantastic. Uh, they all ultimately died because of the, the justice that they had set up. Because remember, if someone seems like they're better than other people, they must die because they are not in the spirit of reason and equality in France. This is why equality was really, really, really ironic. They were saying this because if anyone had anything that was nicer than yours, you would assume they weren't equal and they had to die, which is not equality. That's, that's socialism. Um, but anyways, so Robespierre was actually killed in 1794. He was guillotined after being in charge for one year. Uh, he was in charge one year and then was um, was uh, put to the guillotine. Uh, Georges Danton, uh, also 1794, one year in charge, guillotine. Uh, and then there was Jean-Paul Marat. He died in 1793. He did not die by guillotine. There was this lady named Charlotte Corday. Charlotte Corday did not like Marat. She thought that he was very bad for France, which was not wrong. She, she wasn't wrong there. Uh, but she went about this in a very bad way. Um, she, uh, she killed him because she thought this was bad. And so then she, of course, was, um, she, she was guillotined in 1793 in July as well because of this. Uh, Marat actually wrote a newspaper and so he was one of the ones publishing a lot of these ideas. And because she didn't like his idea that people uh, should be guillotined for things or killed for having things that are nicer, she killed him and then she was killed by the guillotine. It's a very convoluted thing. Okay, moving on. Uh, 
The reign of terror was only for technically a year, but it kind of continued. The The year of the reign of terror was basically when anyone and everyone was accused of something and killed. Uh, after that, the revolution still continued from 94 to 99, but it wasn't as many deaths. There were still deaths, though. Um, so it ended in 1799 with the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte and a military regime that just kind of came in and took over and said, okay, no one can kill me, because, you know, he saw what happened to Robespierre and Murat and, and Danton. Uh, he's, Nobody can kill me because I have soldiers around me. I'm taking over. I'm going to try and fix this. Um, so he came in and, you know, kind of went a little AWOL. And after he went a little AWOL, France actually brought back the, um, the Dauphin, the son of Louis the 16th to be king again. He was not very intelligent because he didn't know how to be king. He was very annoyed because, you know, he had been put in prison as a child and his parents murdered. So he was not the happiest when he came back and uh, didn't make very smart decisions. So then he was gotten rid of and then they started doing presidents and that still has not worked out great for them. And, you know, it's France is just doing so fantastic right now. Uh, Anyways, Napoleon Bonaparte comes in in 1799, and that's kind of the official end of the um, end of all of the insanity. Uh, by the end of it, at least 40,000 people had died um, in the Reign of Terror, and also in those years. Most of those were in the the one year. One year of the Reign of Terror was most of those. There were still some after, but majority of those were were 40,000. Uh, were during the, the year of the Reign of Terror. Uh, as many as 300,000 people were arrested during the Reign of Terror. So 300,000 just in that one year. That's that's literally only the one year, which just seems pretty insane um, for how many. So you can see how these ideas of the Enlightenment where everyone must follow reason and we are all equal and we must question any authority that is put over us when you actually put those into practice, it creates just absolute insanity and bloodshed and just the worst things possible. These concepts have come back because you remember how I, I, I you maybe you remember how I've told you that like with heresies in the church, they'll kind of just repackage and come back like every hundred years or so uh, in a new form. That's kind of what happens with enlightenment. It's come back multiple times in many countries. And the crazy thing is in those countries where it's come back, they have gone woo down very fast. Now they haven't gone quite as insane as the French Revolution reign of terror. Well, I mean in China it has, but um, uh, and with that I'm talking about like church in China and the persecution there and all of that, it's, it's insane. Um, but any of those countries that have actually practiced the ideas of the enlightenment, which nowadays are the ideas of fascism and socialism, they're repackaged into those. Um, they go downhill very badly. It's a frightening country to visit or look into, and it just ends horribly. And you could see this back in the 1700s in France, and yet people are still playing around with this idea of maybe this would be really good for us. And it's it's not. It, it ended very terribly in France, and it hasn't worked out for anybody since. Let's not try it. Uh, but anyways, so that's our go through of the French Revolution. Um, now, what was I going to say? Uh, as you can see, this was really not Marie Antoinette's fault. People perceived her to be a foreigner because she was from Austria. She was the princess of Austria. Um, and people perceived her to be a high spender, which she did spend money. I'm not saying she didn't, she did. Um, but things like the let them eat cake quote, she never actually said that. Um, she was not someone who was saying that the people should be constantly stepped on by the monarchy. Uh, it really was a lot of things that came together that just happened at the right time for everything to just blow up. You just happened to have the Enlightenment come in right when there was a king who was starting to try and fix it, but it was going to be something where it took a while to fix it and the people weren't willing to wait. And so it created, you know, insanity. Um, French Revolution is very fun. Clearly. Uh, now, if you can't tell, there is a reason why I say that's a revolution and why America's not. Because with the French Revolution, it was trying to literally dig in and root out and get rid of 
everything that had defined France up until that point. Religion, monarchy, social order and structure. They tried to get rid of literally every single aspect of that. That's not what happened in America. In America, we kept in those basic aspects. One of the fundamental things about America was Christianity. It was one of the principles it was founded on when it was just colonies. So with the American War for Independence, it was a war for independence. It wasn't a revolution. It wasn't an overthrow of everything that had existed at that time. They kept in place their own government. They kept in place Christianity. They kept in place social structure. It was literally just saying, this is unjust for you to be putting these laws in place and we have no vote say. And if you continue with this, this is breaking constitutional law, it is breaking fundamental law, and it is breaking moral law. And we cannot stand for that. Whereas in France, it was just kind of constant panic and gut reactions to everything. The panic that was started at the National Assembly, it was because people perceived something an incorrect way and it caused a massive panic which ended up with them storming the Bastille on July 14th. It, it just created terror, essentially. And that's not what the American War for Independence was. So there's that reason of why I very set, uh, call one one thing and one the other thing. Uh, anyways, I hope you enjoy this. We are almost done with history for this year. In fact, uh, next, uh, next week is going to be something slightly different. Uh, and that's going to actually take up a couple weeks where I'm going to have you, I'll tell you about it right now, um, so that you can be prepared, at least those of you who watch the video all the way to the end, uh, you can be prepared for this. I'm going to have you write me a report on one of the things we've studied in history this year. And I want you to look into it. You can look at your notes, your quizzes, and you can also research it on your own. And I expect you to research it on your own and find at least a few things that I didn't tell you, uh, because I don't. I mean, one hour is not enough time to delve into nearly everything that happens. But I want you to do a report and research one of the events that we have studied or one of the people or things that we have studied this year. Uh, and I'm going to have you write a report for me. I'll tell you more about this next week. I'm going to start giving you the layout for it and the format um, so that you can get ready to start doing that. But here's just your heads up on that. Yay. All right. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Uh, be good to your parents. I kind of want to say that your homework assignment is to wash the dishes at least one time this week. It's a bonus assignment. There you go. Bonus assignment. End of the video. Wash the dishes for your parents at least one time this week. All right. Have a wonderful day. I miss you all very much. And I hope you do that bonus assignment.